you, Kara. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, the word of God is not bound. And these are not the best circumstances. Uh, it's going to last, Lord willing, hopefully a few more weeks. But the word of God is not bound. And the Lord takes his word and always accomplishes his purpose. And we're thankful for that. And as I'm trying to bring this message I get a lot of comfort from knowing this. The word of God is not bound. I'm going to be speaking from Mark chapter 6, and I've entitled the message for this evening, Christ Marveled at Unbelief. Now you'll see where I got that title as we read these first six verses of Mark chapter 6. And he went out from thence and came into his own country. That's talking about his own town, where he grew up. And his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many, hearing, were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? I can hear the way they said that. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty works, save that he laid his hand upon a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And we went round about the villages teaching. He marveled because of their unbelief. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we ask in Christ's name that your word would not be bound, that you would speak to our hearts according to your will, reveal thyself to us. May we be found in Christ. May our sins be forgiven for his sake. Give us grace to love you more, love one another more. And Lord, accept our thanksgiving. We thank you for who you are and we thank you that salvation is what you do. Now, bless this message for Christ's sake. Be with all your people wherever they meet together. And be with our leaders and give them the wisdom and understanding to do what's right at this time. Bless us for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen. To say that Christ marveled at anything is a very remarkable thing. You see, he knows everything already. And nothing ever takes him by surprise because everything that takes place is his will being done. He is sovereign over everything. And yet this scripture says he was amazed. He was astonished. He was astounded by their unbelief. Now, he had gone back to his hometown, verse 1 of Mark chapter 6, and he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. He went back to the hometown of Nazareth where he'd grown up for 30 years, and he brought his disciples with him. 
Now, when he had left Nazareth, as far as they knew, all he was was a carpenter. And he has been gone, and he's become famous and done many mighty works and uh, had disciples coming back with him when he comes back to his hometown. They'd heard of his miracles, they'd heard of his healing, and they've heard of his teaching. And they're excited about hearing this one come home. Verse 2, and when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Now remember, these were people who had known him all of his life. They knew him when he was a toddler. They knew him when he was a young boy. They knew him when he was a teenager. They knew his family. They knew him. And I think it is so um, enlightening that although the Son of God was before them and though true holiness walked before them, they didn't get it. They didn't really understand who he was. And they heard him speak, and the scripture says, and many hearing him were astonished. And this is not the astonishment of admiration in any way. And here's what they said, from whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? We just can't receive this. We can't get a hold of this. Is not this the carpenter? A run-of-the-mill carpenter. He has no education. He has no wealth. He has no status. He's a run-of-the-mill carpenter. He frames houses. He works with wood. He is a carpenter. From what, How from him come these mighty sayings and these mighty acts? Now, let's go on reading. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? I think Joseph must have been dead by this time. Joseph is not mentioned. The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon. Uh, the Catholic Church says, Mary remained a virgin. No, she didn't. She had other children, and they're mentioned here. And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. I want to look at a passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 11, verse 6. The Lord says, Blessed is he. Oh, when the Lord makes this statement, this is the person who is truly blessed. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now let's look what led him to make this statement. Verse 1, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach <coughs> and to preach in their cities. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Art, how, art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, was John really doubting? I mean, after all, he had seen the Spirit of God come down upon him. He heard the, verse, the voice of the Father when he baptized him. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He's the one who had the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, and he is the one who jumped in his womb when he heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. Could he have doubted? <laughs> yes. He was, like you and I, a man. And he was in prison, probably all kinds of things going through his mind, and he was wondering, is this all a dream? Are you the one? And he sent two disciples and said, Are thou he that should come, or should we be looking for somebody else? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again. John needed to see and hear again. Just like I need to hear the gospel again. Yes, I was thankful for what I heard yesterday, but I need to hear again today. The gospel never grows old. You go show John those things again, which you do hear and see 
the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Now here's the people who are not offended. The blind who can't see why God would have any favor upon them. The lame who can't walk in God's commandments. The lepers defiled by sin. The deaf who can't hear. The, those who are dead in sins. Those who are poor and have nothing to bring to the table. Oh, they're not offended in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he does. But these people were offended. So he says in verse 4, But Jesus said unto them, these people who had seen him grow up, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and his own house. What a shame when there's a true prophet and people refuse to see it. They didn't see the Lord as that prophet. He was just the carpenter. He was just Jesus of Nazareth. And look what verse 5 says. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. Now that doesn't mean that he was prevented from doing something because they didn't have great enough faith. Doesn't mean that at all. He could not do any mighty work there because he would not do any mighty work there. He is not going to work through this atmosphere. He could there do no mighty work save he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And then the scripture says that he marveled because of their unbelief. He was amazed by their unbelief. He knew who he was, and he knew what they had seen, and he was amazed by their unbelief. You see, unbelief is the most groundless, excuseless thing in all of the world. Now, what is unbelief? Now, the best way to answer that is by asking, what is faith? Unbelief is the opposite of faith. What is faith? Faith is believing God. Abraham believed God. God made these promises to Abraham. Abraham didn't have any empirical, tangible proof that any of this would ever take place except the word of God. And that was enough. You see, God can't lie. And he believed God. God. All you have is a word from God with no other evidence and you believe. That's what faith is. You believe what God says. You see he's utterly trustworthy. He doesn't need to have verifications and proofs because of what he says. He says it and it is so because of who is speaking. And every believer is wrapping the entire salvation of their soul resting on upon believing, relying upon what he has said. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. I'm, I'm counting on that. What must I do to be saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I'm relying on if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I'm relying on that. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, I'm calling. Save me. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. Lord, I'm the chief of sinners. That means you came to save me. I am relying on what God has said in his word. Now, unbelief does not believe God. You've all been around someone where you kind of que maybe questioned what they said, questioned the truthfulness of what they said, and they said, are you calling me a liar? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, I don't say it that way. I don't want to appear so rude. It might be somebody who is trying to pick a fight, but that's what you're thinking. Yes, yes, you are a liar. All men are liars, but he's not. He cannot lie because who he is and we believe him explicitly to fail to believe him is to call him a liar. Let me give you an example. 1 John chapter 1, verse 10 says, If we say we've not sinned, and that word is a verb, and it's in the present tense, right now, whatever I'm doing, if I look at you right now, even while I'm preaching, and say, I've not sinned, what I do? I make God a liar is what the scripture says. And his word does not abide in me because he says I have sinned. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now if I deny that, I'm calling God a liar because that's God's testimony. Isaiah 64, 6 says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Now, in unbelief, understand this. Understanding is not the problem. In unbelief, understanding is not the problem. No, you understand and I understand exactly what's being said. For instance, to say that the Bible is the word of God, every word inspired, who doesn't understand that? It means every word is inspired. Now, you might not believe it because you don't like the implication to that. That means if it is the inspired word of God, I've got to believe what it says. And I've got to believe exactly what it says. And it might run contrary to what I think. Uh, to say that God is sovereign means he's the first cause of everything. And that means everything. He is in control of everything. Now, what's hard to understand about that? You might not like it. You might disagree with it because it, the implications of it you can't uh, go on with, but you understand it. To say that men are dead in sins. You know what that means. Somebody's dead can't do anything. Uh, can a dead man believe? Can a dead man repent? Can a dead man love? No, you understand what that means. Now, you might not like it. You might not like the implications of it. You might like, not like what it says about you, but you understand. To say that God chose who would be saved before time began, there's nothing to hard, hard to understand about that. Everybody that hears that knows exactly what it means. You might not like it, but it's not hard to understand. To hear that Christ actually saved the elect when he died, when he said it is finished, their salvation was accomplished, nobody says, well, what's he mean by that? You know exactly what that means. That means if Christ died for you, you must be saved. It means he's everything in salvation. Now, you can find things you disagree with uh, because of the implications of that. Well, that, that means you didn't die for everybody. That doesn't seem fair. And all of a sudden, we become God's judge. That, do, uh, that, that doesn't even seem fair. God shouldn't be that way. Uh, to say God's grace is irresistible and invincible, his grace actually saves, everybody listening knows exactly what that means. You might not like it. To say you have to persevere all the way to the end, to be saved. Only he that endures to the end shall be saved. Everybody knows what that means. You see, this thing of unbelief is not a lack of understanding. It's a hatred for what is said and a rejection of what is said. It is a willful rejection. There is no love for God as he is, rather enmity, and nice people turn mean when they hear the gospel. No love for the message of the gospel, quite frankly, because in their own mind, they do not need it. And the gospel destroys what they are hoping in. Unbelief is a willful choice. You hear what you, you hear, you understand, but you don't like it. Now, when you believe, you don't choose to believe. You believe something because it's the truth. You don't Say, well, I'm going to choose to believe that. No, you believe something because it's the truth. But if you don't believe, there's a willfulness in it. Now, all who believe have this in common. The 
gospel is good news to them. Every aspect of the gospel is good news. It's good news that God's given us a written revelation. What do we have if we don't have that? It's good news that God is sovereign, that he's in control of everything. If he's not, oh, we're in trouble. It's good news to know that God elected a people, that Christ accomplished salvation for those people, that God's grace is invincible and irresistible. That's good news. It's good news to know that he preserves his people. Good news. <laughs> now, to an unbeliever, this is not good news news. It's good news to sinners. Now anything that will keep this from being good news to you, here's the only reason. Self-righteousness. That's it. It's only self-righteousness that will keep a man from re rejoicing and finding the gospel as offensive. Now unbelief is the chief sin. The Lord looked at these people and he marveled at their unbelief. Unbelief is the chief sin. When Christ says when he shall come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he shall convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. He said of sin, because they believe not on me. Now that's his definition of sin. Believing not on him. And do you know when you're convinced and convicted by God the Holy Spirit of sin. You quit thinking, well, I can get things straightened up one of these days when I want to. You find out faith is out of your reach. The only You don't even know what it means to believe, and the only way you can believe is if by the grace of God giving it to you. And you start asking, Lord, give me faith. But unbelief is the chief sin. Now, the reason it's the chief sin is it's the mother of all other sins. What did Eve fail to do in the garden? Satan said, you'll not surely die. You don't have to believe what God said. And she bit the hook. She failed to believe God. And she ate of the fruit. And that is what brought every other sin that's ever been committed. That's what brought the fall of Adam that's what every sin comes from, the sin of unbelief. And unbelief will damn a man. The Lord said, he that believeth and is baptized, the same shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now somebody says, can somebody be unbelieving when they've never heard the gospel? Yes. As a matter of fact, Every man that's damned is damned because of unbelief. There's some aspect of God that they could have known that they rejected. Let me read you a passage of scripture from Romans chapter 1. Paul says in verse 18, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it to them. This is every man, woman born into this world. They got the light of nature. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Everybody is born with this knowledge. God's eternal. Nobody made him. He's all powerful. He made the world. And he is God. Only God can do this. His eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. They took God and made him like me and you are, or four-footed beasts, 
or creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up. Now, what did they do? They failed to live up to the light that God gave them, and God turned the lights out. If a man is damned, it will be because of his unbelief. Even if he's never heard the gospel, if he live up to the light that God gave him, God would give him more. But men reject the truth. It was unbelief that prevented the children of Israel from entering the promised land. You remember only two out of that whole bunch that left Egypt, only two entered the promised land, jo Joshua and Caleb. The rest that were over 20 years old when they left, they died in the wilderness and they didn't enter in because of unbelief. You see, unbelief does not believe his word. Now, somebody says, I believe the Bible is the word of God, but do you pay any attention to what it says? That's the question. In John chapter 5, verse 37, And the Father himself, which has sent me, hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he has sent, him you believe not. Now, they fought for the inspiration of the scriptures, but they didn't believe him. Therefore, they didn't really believe the word. Look what the Lord says in John chapter 5, verse 45. Do not think that I'll accuse you to the Father. There's one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, and in reality they didn't, although they would have said they did, how shall you believe my words? Now, the difference between a sheep and a goat is this thing of belief. He looked at the Pharisees and said, you believe not because you're not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. My father which gave them me is greater than all and no man shall pluck them out of my father's hands. Now, he didn't say you're not a sheep by not, he said, you believe not because you're not of my sheep. He didn't say, you don't become a sheep by believing. All sheep believe. And that is the evidence of someone that God has done something for. They believe the gospel. They believe the word of God. Now, if you're a believer, and you know this by painful experience, if you're a believer, you still have unbelief. Your cry is always, always, as long as you have an old nature, your cry is always, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You see, the old man never believes, and the new man always believes. And I think it's amazing, even after his resurrection, he upbraided the disciples for their unbelief and hardness of heart. If you're a believer, unbelief is your biggest problem. The disciples said, why could we not cast them out? He said, because of your unbelief. Christ marveled. He was amazed. It's so excuseless. It's so groundless. It's so wicked. It's so debauched. Christ was amazed at their unbelief. But did you know there's something else that it says he marveled at in the scripture? In Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. When Jesus heard what this man had said, when Jesus heard, he marveled. Now remember, it's an amazing thing for Christ to marvel at anything because of who he is. But when he heard what this man said, the scripture says he marveled. He was astonished. He was filled with admiration. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. 
Now, he marvels at these people's unbelief, but here he marvels at what he calls great faith. Now, let's read what it was said by this man that he marveled at and commended his faith as the greatest faith in all of Israel. Verse 5, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him. This man was not Jewish. He was a Roman centurion. Saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. Now look at this man's response. I would have said, well, come on. This is great. I'm glad you're coming. But look at this man's response. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority. I understand authority. Having soldiers under me, I say to this man, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. I understand authority. And I understand that you have such authority that all you have to do is speak the word. You don't have to make a move to my house. All you have to do is speak the word because of your absolute authority as the God of glory. All you have to do is speak the word and my servant shall be healed. When Jesus heard, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Now, upon the surface, I would not have called this the greatest faith in Israel. I think of Noah spending 120 years building ark because he believed what God told him was going to take place. He was the butt of jokes everywhere. Look at that crazy idiot building that ark. But he kept building, kept building 120 years knowing the flood was going to come and he believed God. Now, I would have called that great faith. Or what about Abraham when God called him to go out to a place that he didn't know anything about and he just started walking, not knowing what was behind it simply believing what God said. Or what about when he offered up his son on the altar, believing that God would raise him from the dead? I call that great faith. What about David running at Goliath fearlessly with that sling and stone and saying, you've defied the armies of the Lord of hosts. And he told him he was going to take his head off and he came running at him without fear. I call that great faith. But look at this man's faith. Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I'll come and deal and heal him. And the sordorian said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldst come under my I've, I've, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. You don't need to go to my house. I'm not worthy. This man had such a low opinion of himself. He didn't think he had anything to bring to the table. He was a sinful man and he knew it. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to even speak your name. You know, great faith always has low views of self. And those low views of self are founded in a high and exalted view of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you speak the word only because of your authority, because of who you are, the God-man, I have no doubt that he knew who Christ was because of who you are. You speak the word only and my servant shall 
be healed. Now the Lord marveled. And you know, really, he's the only one who is qualified to know what great faith is. And what does he say about this man who we're not all that impressed with? He saw himself as utterly unworthy. And he saw Christ's ability. And the Lord said, this is the greatest faith in Israel. Do you know this is attainable to you and me by the grace of God? This same faith. Have a low view of yourself. You know, however low your view is, it really isn't low enough, is it? Oh, we're so sinful and needy. Have a low view of yourself. And have a high and exalted view of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't think of him high enough. He's God the Son. The wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. He's the one who is the Lord. He's Lord of all. He's Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. He's the Christ. He's God's prophet. He's the very word of God. He's God's priest who brings his own blood. He's God's king who rules and reigns. You can't think of him highly enough. Great faith believes his ability. Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Now this faith that Christ called the greatest in Israel, by his grace, is attainable. To me and you. All we have to do is see ourselves as utterly unworthy. That all he has to do is speak the word and it takes place because of his ability. That is great faith. And the Lord marveled at it. He didn't see this very often. May the Lord give you and I this great faith. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask in Christ's name, that name which is above every name, that we would exercise this great faith, seeing our own unworthiness, sinfulness, and the power of thy Son and his ability to save. Grant us this faith for Christ's sake. <clears throat> In his name we pray. Amen. Well, Lord willing, I'll see you.